Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. And welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and happy Valentine's Day. Um, however you celebrate or don't celebrate, I hope you had a wonderful Friday. I, um, my theory is, yeah, it could be a made-up holiday, but uh, it's a day to celebrate the ones we love, to celebrate love in general, and to eat lots and lots of chocolate. So I am not going to complain about that. In terms of uh, today's interview, I am speaking with author Walt Gregg about his new book, The Chosen One. And when we were doing the interview over the weekend... I told him that it would be uh, published today on uh, February 14th. And he said, well, it's not really a Valentine's book. <laughs> and I said, hey, there's there's some uh, there, there's a romantic relationship in it. And, um, it, you know, not everybody wants that kind of a Valentine's Day. So if uh, action is more your thing, then this might be the perfect Valentine's Day book for you. Let me go ahead and give you the description of the Chosen One by Walt Gregg. A fundamentalist arm, Islamic army is on the march in the Middle East, and the fight to stop the spread of madness will take everything the American military can muster. In this novel, from the author of the Thin Red, or excuse me, the Red Line. Two months ago, a new leader arose in the Islamic world, the Mahdi, or the Chosen One. He has rallied fundamentalist fighters across the Middle East who have driven deep into Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Standing against them are allied forces made up primarily of the American military. It's a desperate fight. From armored battles in the desert to waves of cruise missiles aimed at American carriers, the Mahdi proves to have many tricks up his sleeve. Marine Lieutenant Sam Erickson is in the thick of the fighting. He and his company have battled their way from a landing on the Mediterranean shore to the outskirts of Cairo. Now he finds himself at a critical juncture. But can he make the sacrifices necessary for the greater good? So, that is the description of um, The Chosen One by Walt Gregg. It is definitely action adventure. Definitely um, some elements of a thriller. It's a, it's a book about war, of course, but it's also very, very character driven. And instead of just being, you know, 90% action, it really explores the characters. There's, there's multiple storylines happening at once throughout the book, including the uh, storyline of the Mahdi, of what you would consider to be the, the bad guy in the book. And you get to know people's motivations, characters' motivations, their backstories, etc. So you do get that action adventure element. You you get the war the war novel um elements of it, but you also get that character driven storyline. So let's go ahead and uh turn now to the interview so that Walt can tell you more about this book. Hi Walt, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Uh Thanks, Sarah. I, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I am happy to have you here. We are here to talk about your second novel called The Chosen One. Um, before we get to the book itself, though, if you could share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you, that would be great. Uh, well, I, I live in Austin, Texas. My wife and I will celebrate our 36th anniversary next month. Uh, there are four kids and six grandkids. And um uh, I, um, as far as where the writing comes from, I, I write military thrillers and I spent um, 12 years in the Army and then another eight years as a Department of the Army civilian. 
And then after that 20 years, I went to law school at the University of Texas and um, spent another 20 years doing that. And somewhere in the middle of that, I, I decided uh, I, I, a, a book had slapped me in the face when I was in the Army that, that uh, as far as a story, I shouldn't say book, a story slapped me in the face. But I carried that around for years and years and never thought of myself as much of a writer. But at one point, we just decided to go ahead and do it. And here we are. So I, I, there's probably more I could tell you. But uh, my wife tells me I'm pretty boring as it is. So uh, and oh. I actually... I actually make other people more boring just by listening to me. So uh, maybe we'll leave it at that for now. We can fill in if you'd like as we go. Wow, um, that, that's 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 love right there when you, <laughs> your <laughs> wife can say that kind of thing. Um, so let's talk about the book. As I said, it is called The Chosen One. Can you give uh, an overview of the story? Oh, let me let me do a little background first. Um, every writer, I think, starts with a what if. Um, what if, uh, you know, we were able to clone dinosaur DNA and put them on an island? You know, I think we've all seen that movie. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so I like history. I, I don't consider myself to be an expert in history, but I, I'm certainly fascinated by it. Um, I'm, I'm one of those who's convinced if you don't know where you've been, you sure don't know where you're going. Um, so I like to look historically and what I like to do is take historical events and move them forward and, and put a what if to them. What if they happen now? Um, so with the chosen one, um, I had grown up in a very, um, fundamentalist Christian family and, they had lived and breathed the end of days, whether it was the rapture or revelations or whatever. They 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 thought about it every day. So that was something that, that I was aware of. And so I kind of became fascinated historically with the fact that so many religions have an end of day prophecy. Um, I mean, we've got the Mayans in their calendar. I'm, I'm you know, it seems like just about any religion that's ever existed has had it an end of days fascination to it. Um, so I um, started looking at the various end of days prophecies. And the one that jumped out at me historically was actually Islam's prophecy. Um, and it, it's about the rise of someone called the Mahdi, M-A-H-D-I, um, which also, which translates into guided one or chosen one. And he is supposed to rise, uh, conquer the world for Islam, and then lead the world. Um, and I'm trying, I'm giving a very simplistic view of or, or description of it, but lead the world, world through its very happy final days, which will run, um, I've seen varying times, anywhere from five to 19 years. And then at the end of that, that will be the end of days. Uh, and so in looking, I discovered there'd been a number of Mahdi's, people who claimed to be the Mahdi through history. And there was one um, fairly recent, historically anyway, event in 1885 where a Mahdi arose in the Sudan and raised a fanatical army um, that wiped out the British. It was a very crushing blow for the British. They were absolutely stunned by what happened to their army. Um, and um, so I looked at that, and all I did was kind of take the 1885 incident, uh, come up with a different form of Mahdi, and moved it forward to now with, with a fanatical army. Um, and so I think the character I chose as the Mahdi is one of the most interesting I've ever written. He's probably the most in-depth antagonist uh, I've ever had. Uh, I loved writing the chapters about his life uh, and trying to present him in a very three-dimensional way. And so um, he rises, and at that point then he decides, uh, and he's he creates a federation of Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, and Sudan, and he decides he first needs to conquer and unite the Islamic world before he moves out to conquer the entire world. So he attacks Egypt, and um, is, he's doing quite well. His massive army is on the doorstep of Cairo. They're on the banks of the Nile. 
and kind of was about to fall when the Americans desperately step in and try to stop him. So that's kind of a quick synopsis of where the book starts. Um, I, I don't know if I want to say any more than that at this point. Right. Well, we don't want to give too much away. And instead of giving anything away, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. On a really quick side note, I just realized that uh, had I not had to reschedule my interview that should have aired on Tuesday, this episode would have been episode 214 on 214. Now I'm just sad. Okay, let's go ahead and take that first break. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the Mahdi and his role in the book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Walt Gregg about his new book, The Chosen One. Before the break, we were talking about the Mahdi, who is the um, adversary in this book. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that character and writing that character. One thing I did appreciate, and, and you brought this up when you were writing about the Mahdi's life, was making him very human so we got to know him and his reasons rather than just have him be this kind of caricature of a a religious fanatic leader you know you you tried to give him depth and and uh, backstory to make to make it the reader understand a little better not just have him be this kind of black and white bad guy um well like how yeah yeah Uh, go go ahead go ahead no, no, I, I was just, I was just gonna say, how, how was that for you? You know, trying to kind of walk that line of having a a, a bad guy, but not making him stereotypical. Uh, well, I, actually, it was a lot of fun. Like I said, those were some of the favorite chapter, my favorite chapters I've ever written. Um, and really, what I was doing uh, was looking at another question I think is very fascinating, and that is, how do we become who we become? Um, I, I think that's a very interesting question and, and thing to look at. How in the world did we get to believing what we believe and and doing what we do with our lives? And I not only do that with him, I do it with um, a number of the other characters. Um, My lead uh, character, Sam Erickson, who's a Marine lieutenant, I do the same with him and his love interest, Lauren Wells, and and, um, uh, a few of the other characters. And so I kind of, that was kind of what I was doing with... um, the Mahdi was was simply showing the reader how he became who he became because he wouldn't have been this person if it wasn't for outside influences. Very, no way he would have been anything like this. Um, but circumstances lead him to this, and I, and I think it's it was really kind of fun to let those circumstances unfold. And um, and, and I love the character because I, I just recently had a. Um, a reader who uh, um, was a friend of my wife's, actually, and and she said, um, she said, you know, I, I really loved that character, but I didn't know if I was supposed to love him or hate him. And I said, well, you're supposed to do a little of both. And and so I think I, I did that fairly well, I hope, and, and readers will enjoy him along with the other characters. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I don't want to give stuff away, <laughs> but there's a there's a, a kind of a relationship that he has with another character in the book that where you can really see more of his character and 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 how he's developed into the leader that he is. But again, I don't want to give stuff away. So this is a cast. Uh, it's a it's a book with multiple characters. Um, kind of the. Uh, Sam is kind of the main character, but there's a lot of of, um, supporting characters. But in terms of characters, 
what about Sam Erickson do you think might resonate with readers? Well, again, I tried to do a, a bit of a backstory there. Um, I, I didn't want to make him two-dimensional either. I wanted him to have um, a, some depth to him, and but I but I wanted him to be someone readers could relate to. Um, and, and let me even back up a minute here. What I do in my books, my first book, The Red Line, um, I actually wrote five different storylines at once. So as you're reading through, you're moving from story to story, and they bounce in and out of the book. Uh, it allows you to see everything that's going on um, because no one character could show you everything. I do the same thing in The, Re in the Chosen One. Um, I have four storylines going on at once. There's Sam Erickson, my Marine uh, Reconnaissance Platoon Lieutenant, who's the first one to set foot on the beaches in Egypt. Um, there's um, Charlie Sanders, who's a Green Beret uh, demolitions expert. There's um, um, Bradley Mitchell, who's an F-18 pilot off an aircraft carrier. And then there's Darren Wells, who's a platoon sergeant in, uh, who's a platoon sergeant for a Bradley fighting vehicle platoon. And those four stories, again, move the story along. So you get to see everything because I don't like to write a lot about generals and the president and all those kind of people that are in the story, but they're not important to me. I love to write about ordinary people. I like to write about sergeants and lieutenants and privates and and uh, because those, are, you know, those are the people that really count in my mind. Um, so what I like to do is put ordinary people in extraordinary situations and watch how they react. Um, so Sam Erickson's background is that he grows up in a in a in a family where his father was a Marine and is killed in action, and he himself wants to become a Marine. Um, almost since the day he's born. And again, it's how he became who he became. His background creates who he is. Uh, he's quite quite intelligent. Um, he joins the Marines the day after he graduates from high school and is so outstanding that he's one of the handful of uh, Marines and sailors that are picked uh, a few years later to enter the Naval Academy. So he goes to the Naval Academy comes out and and as a marine officer and we go from there. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, the multiple storylines actually uh had me thinking in terms of how do you keep track of everything you have going on in your books? So not only do you have multiple storylines, but there's also a lot of action sequence sequences and a lot of uh you know battle scenes. How do you keep everything straight? Um uh, dumb luck. I'm not sure. <laughs> I uh, actually, I, I got to admit to your readers that having the multiple storylines lets me cheat because if I get stuck on one character and I'm staring at the screen, I just move on and write on one of the other characters. So it's not unusual for me to write chapter 17 before I write chapter 13. Uh, more li most, most likely it's two different characters. And, and I know from what's happened with Sam Erickson in chapter 13 what his next step's going to be when he shows up again, which would be in, say, Chapter 17. So um, I'm not a big outliner. I don't really do much of that. Um, I, At the beginning of any book, I know how the book starts, and I know how it ends. And everything in the middle, we just make up as we go. I, I, it's um, What we do is my wife and I will sit down and – kind of mini outline a chunk of chapters, anywhere from three to five, uh, whatever's coming up next. And that could include two Sam Erickson chapters and one Charlie Sanders chapter, and who knows what the other one or two will be. And my outlines are very, very brief, um, six or eight little lines, just make sure you cover this, um, do this in this chapter, don't forget whatever. And then I just sit down and I write. And I often write the middle of a chapter first or the end of a chapter first or two sentences at the beginning and jump somewhere else. I mean, it just, uh, to me, it's like putting together a huge jigsaw puzzle. And I guess I kind of know it when I look at it. I can recognize the picture. I kind of know the book's done. It's finished. Um, but how I keep it straight, um, 
Well, like most writers, I probably go over every word a hundred times. So uh, by then, I've pretty much got it memorized. And, and you do, from time to time, you'll go in there and go, even on the 90th time through, you go, oops, that's a mistake. I just realized what I did there. And you and you fix it. So I don't have a magic formula, and I certainly would never try to teach another writer how to write. Um, I assure you, when I went over my... Um, well, Tom Clancy's editor is my editor also at Penguin Random House. And when I went over how I did this with him at lunch one day, he looked at me like I had six heads. So um, I, I I don't know. I just put them together. I'm, I'm not sure. I I feel like uh, my type A listeners out there, their heads just exploded a little bit. So for you type A readers who are, you know, kind of going, blah, how does he deal with that? Let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast and you can recover. And when we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about that writing process and how it works for Walt, even if it might not work for others. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Walt was talking about the way he writes and how he doesn't tend to do a lot of outlining. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that process and how his creative process works for him as a writer. Well, it's supposed um, to be creative hey, writing. so um, That's right. Whatever know, I, works for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what I would say to anybody who's writing is you do it your way. I have, you know, very famous writers that I know who their outlines are so detailed they've almost written the book by the time they finish their outlines. I have others that are, are like me. They don't outline at all or they outline very little. Uh, it's just whatever works for you works for you. Uh, reader's not going to care, I don't think, how I got there as long as I got there, you know. So I, I don't get too stressed out about it. Um, Obviously, when I'm writing my drafts, I'll end up going back um, and having to change things earlier on because it, things just don't fit like I thought they would. You know, I mean, you just you just do it. It's a it's a very long, complicated process. But um, the character, I think I've been told my characters are so vivid. So maybe that's why it works for me is because they just don't. I don't get mixed up with them. I mean, I. I, I see Charlie Sanders. I hear him talking. I, I see um, uh, Bradley Mitchell and and what he's doing, and and um, they do, it just works. I don't know. And like I said, whatever works. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. How much research did you do for the book? Well, quite a lot, um, because in this story, I've got. Um, Marines, big time, big time Marine situation. I've got a Green Beret unit. Um, I've got an aircraft carrier, and then I've got an Army unit. Um, we'll start with the Green Beret. I actually, um, many many years ago, actually did a tour with uh, with the Green Berets with Special Forces, and so I kind of got to know them and who they are. And so I had some, you know, I mean, I had to update um, how they how they're set up now, but it was still pretty close to how it was when I was there. So that was part of that. Um, so I understood the composition of a Green Beret uh, A team, for example, a 12 man A team, and and what that's supposed to look like, and and the various positions in it, and what they do. So that one was a little easier. 
the Marines and, and uh, you know, my first book, the, the Red Line, I had Air Force. Um, luckily, I got to serve um, in the middle of the Cold War. I served at United States European Command Headquarters in Germany, um, and it was a joint service assignment. So I sat right next to um, a Navy chief I for th- three years. Uh, my boss was an Air Force major. Um, I, my running buddy at lunch was a, a Marine major. Um, so I got to learn a little bit about each of them then. Um, but honestly, in writing the Marine part of this story, uh, I had a buddy who lives up in the Dallas area. He lives in a town uh, in the city of Frisco, which is a big and up, up and coming, uh, suburb of Dallas. And he was a Marine, um, helicopter pilot. So he was my technical advisor on the Marine parts. He was, I would write something and I'd send it to him and he'd say, no, 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 no. They wouldn't do it at that time of day. They do it at this time of day, or they wouldn't do it with this kind of helicopter. They do it with it. So he was able to guide me through the parts I didn't know already. Um, and that was helpful. And of course, nowadays with the internet and, and Google and all that good stuff, you can, you can do a lot of reading on things to at least get the basics down before you start looking at what you want to put together for a story. So, it, yeah, it takes a lot of technical work. I don't, I don't know how many times I've stopped and um, gone back and, and pulled up a, very, a, a missile or a, a machine gun or whatever and said, okay, what's the range of this machine gun? What's the range of this missile? How far, how far can it shoot, you know, or... Or how many rounds can it shoot a minute? You know that kind of thing. So it just you just do it. It's it's all part of the process. A lot of people do all the research first. I do the basic stuff first, and then as I go, as I'm literally as I'm writing, I'll stop and click out a word and click into the internet and take a look and then fix make sure that that sentence then is correct. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work. Uh, every author has that. So um, it's just a matter of sitting down and doing it. And when I first started, there wasn't even the Internet yet. So I'd go, to, I'd go to the bookstores and I'd buy books on various aircraft, uh, various fighter aircraft or something like that, and I'd use that. But, uh, you know, nowadays you can, you, can, you can pretty much Google anything you want. You'd be surprised what comes up. So. Yeah, I know that uh, a lot of authors have some pretty interesting search histories if you were to ever go into their – very it's crossed my mind. Yes, it's crossed my mind. Yes. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, that ex- yeah, I bet. Um, that explains a lot of how your military background has come into play. Um, right. Does your your career uh, as a lawyer, as a prosecutor, does that ever influence or you know kind of do you ever draw on that experience for your writing? Well, I think I do. Um, you know, um, writing. A, a legal brief or, or a memo or something or, or an appeal um, is a different process than writing fiction, although I've got to admit there's a lot of legal briefs and appeals that have a lot of fiction in them. Um, but in law school, I think I, I learned how to um, logically put things together because every lawyer will tell you that the idea um, – when you're in front of a jury is to tell them a story um, and, and to put that story in some kind of logical form that will make sense to them. So I think all of that helped. It helped me to kind of um, sharpen my mind as far as how do I go about telling a story. So I think there is an element of that. I mean, I'd never want to write a legal, legal thriller. That's, that would bore me to death. But um, – I think there's a lot of what um, the legal part in how I approach the writing, yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, how was writing the second book uh, different from writing the first one? Was it a little easier in some ways, or was it just a completely different process? Well, they're, they're two completely different books, uh, completely different characters, completely different scenario. Um and so they were separate and distinct, and I treated them that way. So um, I think it was easier writing the second one in that I had 
kind of worked out with the first one. Um, it took me a while. It took me a couple of years to really get where I, I assure you my first draft wasn't all that great, you know, so it took me a couple of years to get where I was really happy with the writing. And I, and I think, uh, the red line, my first one, um, about two years after I started writing, I entered it in a, a writing contest with 700 entries and took second place. So I think I was doing okay. Um, but it, it it was a learning process. I think every writer, um, even those who go through the fine art masters and fine arts programs, have to develop their ability to write. And so I did that with the first book, and then my approach of doing multiple storylines and having multiple characters, um, I took that from the first book and used it in the second. But again, they were completely separate stories, so it was kind of easy to to uh, just completely rebuild, you know, start from the ground up and build the Mahdi, build uh, Sam Erickson, build Charlie Sanders. Um, and they were not anything like any of my characters in the first book. Sure. And actually that, that uh, sparked a question that I wanted to ask you. So, again, not wanting to give things away, but um, mm-hmm. in terms of this book, it does have a bit of uh, open-endedness to it in the conclusion Uh, um are you planning to revisit this world at some point um well actually the i've got a third novel uh, i'm writing right now that's already sold pentagon random house has already bought it um it'd be good if i finished it i guess since i have a deadline um but it's it i will tell you that that many of the characters are coming back uh sam erickson is coming back lauren wells is coming back Charlie Sanders, Darren Walton, um, they're coming back in the next book. So it'll be characters that the readers are familiar with, but it's not going to be what, Sarah, I suspect you're thinking it's going to be. It's going to be a completely different um, storyline as far as location and uh, antagonist and things like that. Um, if I said any more than that, I'd give I'd give away some things. The ending from the first one, uh, from the chosen one. So I don't want to do that. But um, it's actually going to be a a, a different different war, um, different location, but many of the same characters. Okay. So it's Thank sort of a follow up, but it's it's uh, in, in in that the characters are coming back, a lot of them, but it's again a completely new storyline for the reader. Right. Okay. Thank you. When we come back from this break, we're going to talk about what Walt likes to read in his spare time. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to build that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Walt Grigg about his book, The Chosen One. When you take the time to read for yourself, do you have favorite um, authors or genres that you tend to go to? Well, it's different now than it was. I mean, my if, if you ask me who are your favorite authors, I'm going to go back to the 70s and 80s. It's going to be uh, Euros. Clavel, Michener, um, those guys could really write epic novels. I mean, there, there's, um, 
you know, Clavel with Shogun and and uh, Michener with Centennial and Euros with Mila 18 and Exodus and Queen. Uh, um, shoot, I, um, I forgot the name of the next one. Uh, Queen's Bench. I forget what it is. Um, those were all just incredible, and I kind of go that way. Um, I know I had a review in um, the Providence Journal newspaper of the chosen one, where the where the uh, reviewer said that um, this that my writing, as far as you know, I don't write techno thrillers. I, I'm not I'm not fascinated by the weapons and what ca- uh, what what the latest you know, different kind of, of automatic weapon is. Weapons to me are nice for those people who like that kind of story, but it's the characters that matter. It doesn't matter about the weapon. It's the person behind the weapon. And so um, I'm much more focused on that kind of writing. And this individual that reviewed it for the Providence Journal said that because of the literary sensibilities to the story, because of the character development and things of that nature, he actually equated the book to um, the chosen one to Winds of War. I don't know if you remember that book, Herman Walk, um, which mm-hmm. was out in probably the eighties, maybe nineties. Um, and to um, From Here to Eternity, I was a little shocked that that was the two books he said it was. He felt it was most like so. Um, so it's more of a. Um, People oriented war story. Yes, I'm going to give you lots of tanks blowing up, but that's to me secondary to um, uh, to getting to know Sam Erickson and and Muhammad Murad the Mahdi and those folks. Um, so, but yeah, I like Eurus, I like Clavel, I like Michener. Um, I hate to say which modern writers I like because a lot of them are friends of mine, and. I, I don't want to sound like I'm I'm helping them out or something. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 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 um, uh, certainly acquainted with and have spoken many times with Lee Child or, or David Morell, who wrote all the Rambo books, and R. L. Stein, who's a wonderful little man who wrote all the Goosebumps books for kids and people like that. Um, a lot of my reading nowadays actually is for aspiring writers who will ask me to. To, to beta read their book or, or give them some help. Um, so sometimes I, re- I find some really good stuff and sometimes not so much. Um, but like I said, if I, if I, I consider Michener Clavel and Eurus as, um, as the classics and, and uh, they're the ones I fall back on when I'm thinking about how I would love to write. I can't write nearly as well as they did, I'm sure, but but I, I would love to, to someday reach them. Um, and actually, my favorite book of all time is 100 years old at this point, and that's All Quiet on the Western Front, which very much influences my writing, um, because I don't write books that glorify war. If anything, it's quite the opposite. Um, I try to prevent it in a way, uh, present it in a way that's very realistic, very stark, um, but... Because I think um, glorification of war is a really bad thing, and I think that comes from my background. Um, I am a Vietnam veteran, things like that. So um, I try to write stories with with depth to them rather than just the latest techno thriller that's going to glorify every button and switch on the latest piece of technology. Um, That's just kind of how I approach it. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm... Fascinated that you mentioned All Quiet on the Western Front because I was just uh, – my other interview this week was with um, an author who wrote a book about the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. And oh. um, one of the one of the pieces that he talked about in there was um, a screening of that movie where the uh, – they weren't in power yet, but the Nazis disrupted it and um, did a whole thing to – because they didn't like the movie. Um because of its anti-war message. So I, I just think that's fascinating that it came up. Um, well, uh, Remark, you know, the uh, Eric Remark was the, uh, Eric Maria Remark was the author. And um, he actually uh, was kicked out of Germany or fled, I'm not sure which, went to Switzerland first, and I believe he came to the United States after that. Um, he 
did write another book called Stalingrad, which was um, a remark was very interesting because he spent four or five years, whatever it was, in World War I. Uh, as a German soldier, and all quiet in the Western Front is told from the perspective of a German soldier. And um, Hitler, of course, was a World War I German soldier. And I could, I, Hitler hated All Quiet on the Western Front. He despised it. And so I'm, like I said, I know Remark left the country. I think he fled, but they might have actually kicked him out. Um, either way, he was smart to do so. I, I'm sure Hitler would not have allowed him to live. Um, and then he mm-hmm. does write, um, I'm only familiar with a second book called Stalingrad that he writes about the siege of Stalingrad, which a very, was a very good book, too. Um, obviously not one he had firsthand knowledge of, like All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, I know you have a website, so can you tell people where they can find uh, what the address of your website is and where they might be able to interact with you on social media? Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's Walt Gregg, and that's G-R-A-G-G, dot, uh, books, I'm sorry, Walt Gregg Books, dot com would be the website and then there are two facebook sites they can go to there's walt Gregg books or there's just walt Gregg. uh either one of those will work um we um have stuff going on on there all the time and we post you know new things that have happened new reviews we get or things of that nature um and and luckily all the reviews have been really great for the chosen one we um uh, um, we have uh, just had some great ones in the response to the book, uh, both from from regular readers and from reviewers, has been really, really great. So well, it's it's not hard to find stuff to put up there at this point. But those are the the three places they can go. They can go to the website Walt Gregg Books, or they can go to Facebook Walt Gregg Books, or just Walt Gregg. And those are kind of sites that are open to everybody. You don't have to join them or anything. Um, you know, I don't have to accept you as a friend on there. Just come on in. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, one more break. And when we come back, we'll have the conclusion of this interview with Walt. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Walt Gregg. Well, we've talked about a variety of topics, but is there anything that we have not covered that you wanted to bring up about the book or about your writing in general? Anything we haven't covered? Well, I mean, I know you had asked me originally to maybe address um, um, some tips for aspiring writers, and it's Kind of funny that you did because I actually do that at a couple of conferences. I work with aspiring writers, but before I do that, let me let me let your readers know uh, both books, both the Red Line and the Chosen One. Uh, again, you can read whichever one you want first because they don't have anything to do with each other. Um, are available on audiobook, ebook, or in print. Um, I know I still the old fuddy duddy that I am. I still like to hold the book in my hands. Um, but I know others prefer the ebook or the audio book. Uh, my wife has three books going at once, one of each variety. So um, she's quite the voracious reader. So I know there, there's some real variety there. So they can find it in any of those. They can go on Barnes & Noble or Amazon or any of those sites, and they all come right up. Um, so there's that. I'd like them to know that because they get asked that a lot. Um, and it's one of the questions I get asked a lot is, 
well, how long did it take you to write this book after people read it? And I can honestly say I don't know because there are, even after you've sold them, you go back and rework and rework and rework. Even when your editor thinks they're great, you, you try to make them a little better. Um, so I can't. It's a. It's really funny because every time I, every time I, I uh, like make a presentation, I get asked that, and I really don't know. So the answer to that is, I don't know. So you, um, um, for your readers, when they read these books, if they say, "Oh my God, this couldn't have been easy," uh, I will tell you it's not easy, but but we get it done. Um, and then let me go on to your questions about aspiring writers. As I mentioned, um, I work at two conferences each year. Um, I had a lot of help from from other thriller writers. That they're a great group. They uh, like to help aspiring writers. Uh, they really do. The belief is not that if you sell a book, people aren't going to buy mine. It's the opposite. If if you sell a great thriller, then people might be looking for a different kind of thriller, and maybe they'll buy mine. So we always try to help. And I had a lot of help from others, so I always try to pay it forward at this point. So in late June every year, I work at the Writers League of Texas conference, which is held in Austin. Um, There's usually about 300 aspiring writers there. And I don't work with them on how to write. Like I said, I'd, I'd rather not they not learn how to write like I do. Um, it probably would drive most of them crazy. But um, I work with them on the harder part of this profession, and that is how to sell, how to get your book, how to get an agent, and then how to get an editor from that. And that's actually, like I said, probably the harder part. Writing the books, um, sadly, Difficult, but but probably easier than breaking into this really challenging industry. Um, but what I do is we have about 20 or 30 agents and editors that come to that conference, and they will take pitches from aspiring writers. So the night before we start that, then I, I work with the 300 of them um, to try to polish their pitches and give them some ideas what agents are looking for and what things to do and what things not to do, that kind of thing. And then I do similar things at a much bigger conference um, about 10 days later at the in New York uh, Thriller Fest, which is a conference of about 1,000 writers. But I work with, with them there, too, to, to work on their pitches. So, uh, And that's a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding by aspiring writers. They get a lot of um, uh, wrong information. So... A lot of the time is spent trying to correct that. Other writer, other writers will do the same with aspiring writers. We try to help, um, and so um, we do that. I do that, and that's that's always fun. And nothing pleases me more than getting an email back from one of them saying, "I got an agent. I got an agent," because it is a very very difficult po- process. And of course, the publishers won't talk to you without an agent. So, uh, and of course, the agents are impossible to get. So it's it's a real challenge. Um, and I know you had a question here about um, what would I, um, what, what advice would I give to aspiring writers? And that's a great question. Um, first off, I think they need to understand that getting published is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, this is a very, very slow process. Um, even after I sold my first book, it didn't come out for almost three years. And that was after I sold it, and it took a long time to sell it. Uh, I've met a lot of these folks at conferences who think, I'm going to start writing today, and by Christmas my book will be the number one bestseller. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. This often, this is very, very frustrating. you you got to get used to a lot of hearing the word no. Um, and it's really tough because you put your heart and soul into your work only to have you know, 50 people come in and say, oh, it's just not good enough, or oh, I just don't like this, or oh, whatever. So you just have to gut it on through and make it a marathon, not a sprint. The the writers who do succeed recognize they're in this for the long haul, not just the, uh, I'm going to write a book real quick, and I'm going to get an agent next week, and I'm going to sell it. You know, it doesn't work that way. So that would be the first thing I would tell them is, just kind of batten down the hatches and get ready to grind this out. Um, the next thing I would say, the biggest mistake that 
as frame writers make is they submit work before it's ready. Never, never, never send a first draft. Um, don't send it until it's as perfect as you can make it. Um, polish it and polish it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Like I said, I probably, with the chosen one, probably looked at every word a hundred times. The same with the red line. And there's a lot of words in those books, so it's it's a lot of work. Um, but you got to do that. Um, my attitude is I know it's ready when I feel like the words are leaping off the page. And until then, um, I'm going to keep working on it. So don't say anything too soon because once that agent tells you no, they're not going to, 99 times out of 100, they won't reconsider it. Um, so you've burned your bridge with that agent. Um, so don't, don't run off too quickly and, and try to sell it. Make sure it's the be- absolute best you can make it. Um, I, my belief, in, and I tell them this when I'm working with them at the conferences, is you need three things to be a successful writer. Talent, persistence, and luck. The, talent, the great news is the talent can be developed. Like I said, if you'd have looked at my first draft, you'd have thought, oh, my God, this guy can't put a sentence together. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, de- you can work on it. You can develop it. It can get better. It can, you can polish. You can learn. So the talent part, again, you can develop that. So don't be too scared if it, or, or too upset if the first thing you put on paper doesn't look that great. Keep working on it. Um, you can uh, go to writers' conferences. There are millions of them. I highly recommend it. Um, I mean, you go to Thriller Fest, you can sit down and take a class from Lee Child or Steve Barry or Lisa Gardner, just people like that, um, and and listen to them talk about how to write. So you can polish, you can perfect on your on your talent. Persistence is something you just have to develop. As I I'd mentioned earlier, this is a marathon, so you just have to learn to to keep going. Um, you know, just, while you're waiting for your first book to find a home, write a second one. And if I know lots of people who wrote 14 books before their first one got published, and then they were able to go back and take the other 13 and 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 get those published too so it's it just you you got to be got to be tough here and and just hang in there um and then the luck well people say well i can't control the luck but you kind of can um if you'll go to a writer's conference and and pitch the agents when you're ready when you've got a polished manuscript uh in fiction you do need a completed manuscript before an agent or an editor will look at it um, in nonfiction, you need the first chapter and an outline. Uh, in fact, don't write a complete nonfiction book. Uh, they don't want you to. They'd rather uh, you just write a, the first chapter and an outline. And when you have those ready, then go uh, find various conferences, writers' conferences. Like I said, there are tons of them. Um, many of them have agents and editors present. Work yourself up a nice pitch, um, and you can learn how to do that, too. And you sit down face to face with an agent. Um, I know at Thriller Fest you get three minutes and you get to talk to as many as you can talk to. And in that amount of time, there are 60 agents there and it's a um, three and a half hour period. So I know when I did it and got my agent, it was, I pitched nine. Some people pitch 12, 14. So um, you can do that or you can go to other conferences where you get a smaller amount, but they might be 10 minutes long. So you can. Do, Make your own luck by being smart, being professional, being prepared, having a finished product, showing up at a conference, and and just being, you know, having a conversation with these agents because they're just people, and and seeing what happens. So, um, and the, you know, when you get a combination of talent, persistence, and luck, then you're going to find yourself a home, and what do you know? You'll be in Barnes and Noble. So. Uh, so just hang in there. This is not easy. I, I think that's my biggest piece of advice. People underestimate how challenging this is going to be. Well, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And um, I appreciate you taking the time to speak to me today, not only about writing, but about both of your books, The Chosen One and The Red Line. Um, thank you so much, Walt. Well, thank you, Sarah. I, I mean, I hope your readers are at least somewhat curious and We'll uh, take a look at either the red line or the chosen one and 
and who knows, they might find something um, pretty unique there that that might resonate with them. And then again, they may not. But we'll we'll let we'll leave that up to them. I'm hoping they will at least uh, give some thought to taking a look. Absolutely. Um, and yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again to Walt for joining me to talk about his book, to talk about the writing process, to talk about the ways in which he works with aspiring authors and uh, the encouragement he has for them. Um, I really appreciate his uh, his insight and the time he took out of his weekend to talk to me. So thank you, Walt. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. Hope you know how much I appreciate you and your support of this podcast. If you are a fan of this podcast um, and you would like to help us out, it would be awesome if you could subscribe to the podcast uh, and then you'll be the, you know, you'll, you'll always get new episodes. But also if you could give us um, a written review or a five-star review, very cool. As always, if you would like to follow us on social media, I would love to hear from you. You can interact on um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, GSMC Book Review. You can find us. So go ahead and uh, do all those wonderful things that helps a podcast out. I hope you are having a wonderful Friday, um, a wonderful Valentine's Day, whatever that might involve. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend ahead. In the meantime, I hope that that weekend or your Valentine's Day or whatever it is involves plenty of time for you to get yourself lost in a good book. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.